Mama S.A. Ashun is a Southern Voices Network scholar with the Wilson Center's Africa program. She's also a research associate with the African Center for Economic Transformation. She joins us to discuss women, artisanal mining, and peace building in Africa. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I want to ask you first for a definition. What is this particular type of mining that you're talking about and, and why a focus on the particular role of women? Artisanal mining. Okay, so artisanal mining is, is simply a mining method that uses basic or rudimentary tools like um, hoes, pickaxes, shovels, to extract the mineral resources Not from heavy the machinery. ground. No, no, no. Unlike the large scale mining where you use, you know, capital intensive equipment or machinery. Yeah. For artisanal mining is just trying to extract the mineral resources using basic everyday tools. And, and yeah. why are we focusing on the role of, of women? Yeah, it, it is it is important to focus on, on women because women actually make up between 40 to 50 percent of the artisanal mining workforce in Africa as, as compared to the world average of 30 percent. And these, these women are also involved in the sector. They undertake a variety of activities like panning, sieving, digging, carrying water, and, and even sometimes providing sex services or trade. And because of the peripheral nature of the role they play, usually they are, they are hardly considered in the core operational decision making of the mines. They are discriminated against, have limited income opportunities. And, and studies have shown that these discriminatory practices and the structure of the sector can actually discourage these women from taking leadership positions in the sector which also undermines their efforts towards you know, peace building and economic empowerment. And, and there's also a study by the UN that also showed that with some of these discriminatory practices, it can also be powerful catalysts of conflict. And, and so the, the argument is that with most of the peace building initiatives out there, they have also missed the opportunity of including these women artisanal miners in their peace building initiatives. And, and I believe there's a missed opportunity out there because these women can bring more to the peace building table. And, and, and in terms of the peace building, uh, what, what are the specific conflicts that they would be addressing? Yeah, so we, in terms of, let, let, let me just um, talk about the peace building initiatives. Sure. Yeah, so we have the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and with, with a focus on empowering women in general to yes. take part in, you know, peace building efforts. And, and then we also have the UN Women's Initiative. And then we also have regulatory initiatives like the Kimberley Process, the Dodd-Frank Act and all that, with a focus on ensuring that the mining supply chains are conflict free. But where are the women? So that is my main argument. Where do these women artisanal miners fit in here? Because when you're talking about ensuring the mining value chains are conflict free, women are involved in a way because women are also involved in mining. So what role do they play? Why, you know, with the numbers so high, 40 to 50 percent versus yeah. the global average, what, is this a cultural barrier? Why have women not been in, more involved yeah, that, given the numbers? That is a very good question. And, and you know, first of all, in, in the rural areas or in the mining communities, these women are actually the primary providers of food, water, energy, shelter at the household level. And some of them are even the heads of households. And so to provide for their basic necessities, they are highly dependent on the artisanal mining sector. And also in terms of um, and in, the, in the artisanal mining communities where you know, conflicts have taken place, um, usually the outcome of these conflicts are you know, civil wars, internal strife and all that, and which has led to displacement, loss of farmlands, and loss of livelihoods. And, and so in cases where, let's say, agriculture used to be their dominant economic activity, agriculture no longer becomes viable because, you know, farmlands have been destroyed. And so these women are compelled in a way to involve in them, themselves in the sector. Apart from that, because of, you know, devastated farmlands and all that, the men are also involved in the artisanal mining sector. But usually the support these men give to their wives is quite minimal because the they prefer spending their incomes on alcohol, gambling, you know, on prostitutes and, and stuff like that. And so these women shoulder great responsibilities in, in trying to care for their families. And so they are compelled to engage in the sector. So the, you paint a picture that it, it describes a very difficult needle to move or, or problem to change or fix. B because you're talking about culture and lifestyles. You're not yeah. just talking about labor laws, it right? It is all part, yeah. So, so where do you begin? How, how do you begin to change things? Well, first of all, I, I think we, we have to, you know, justify the role that these women play in the sector. And, and it, 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 it is, like I've said, it's very important that these women are actually embracing all these frameworks. But most importantly, I believe there's an urgent need to formalize all artisanal mining operations. That is, bringing the sector in an appropriate policy and legal framework with enforced legislative requirements. How can women benefit from that? 
One, under an, an appropriate legal framework, I believe that it, it will ensure effective and efficient allocation of resource rights and access, that is land rights, which is one of the key issues that these women face. And, and I believe when that is done, it will be a step in even minimizing the participation of women in the sector and also help address the interpersonal and community conflicts that arise over land use and you know, access. But apart from that too, I, I believe under a formalized um, sector, these women can actually be encouraged to form you know, associations and networks, which makes them more eligible to grants, credits, and funds so that they can invest and adopt environmentally sound mining practices, adopt better personal clothing and equipment. And, and also, uh, I believe under, under such a framework, it, it can also be a tool for rural and community development because instead of these miners trading minerals informally, they will be forced to you know, pay royalties and taxes to government. I mean, some form of mineral revenues to government to support in the provision of public goods and services to enhance the welfare of the rural folks, which will also ensure greater equity and security for women. Do you have natural allies in this regard other than the women themselves? Are there governments that are particularly interested or international organizations that are focused on this and, and want to see the changes that you describe? Yeah, I, I believe that I believe the interest the interest is there, but uh, whether it's is is an issue of whether there's the political will. Yeah, because it often it, comes down to political yeah, will. It's, it's the political will because you know in in most of these communities, the core networks are actually the military and political you know figures with some occupying high positions in government and and so who to even consider in decision making is highly sensitive to a political decision mm -hmm. and so it, I believe it all comes down to the political will. So the, the framework you describe is this: does, will this be addressed country by country, or is there a potential for regional cooperation? There's a potential for regional cooperation and then also at the country level, international level. I, I believe it's, it's an all-embracing or holistic approach which should, should be explored. So what are the next steps? How do, you, how do you build more support for these kinds of reforms? Yeah, so, so like I said, formalization, but it is also important that international organizations, peace building organizations, donor, donors, sorry, should I, I believe they should prompt governments on the urgency of formalizing the sector and most importantly try to integrate artisanal mining but especially the role of women artisanal miners into the peace building frameworks and and I, I believe they, they should also support women's you know mining groups to you know supplement their efforts identify their weaknesses resource them and also help support them in undertaking research on women in conflict, post-conflict countries that have been successful in promoting peace in their countries. How did these women do it? What are the best practices? What are the lessons learned? So that they can use the results from such you know, research or methodologies to engage with other policymakers on other approaches to, to contributing to peace in our, in our various countries. Just a, a personal question. Did anyone in your family ever involved in artisanal mining or any, any of your friends, anyone you know? No, not, no, not really. But... Um, you know, I think it's an interesting area to explore. How did you become and, interested in it? You know, where, with where I'm working now at the African Center for Economic Transformation, that was the first project I worked on, Conflict Minerals. And, uh -huh. you know, coming out of graduate school, I had no idea of, you know, what artisanal mining is, what conflicts, you know, minerals and all that is. So I was really intrigued as to, you know, the things I learned, the findings I got from various literature studies and all that. And I was like, wow, so we have these things around and, you know, People are not really talking about right. it. Yeah, and the numbers so, are staggering. Yeah, the numbers are yeah, staggering. So I, I believe it's an interesting area to explore, and, and I'm really appreciative of what I've learned so far. Well, uh, I know another final thought on, on the personal level is your time with uh, the Wilson Center and your involvement in the Southern Voices Network. Has this been useful to you in your work? Yeah, it has been so useful. You know, the f amount of resources, literature, materials um, I've been exposed to, I, I believe I've learned a lot. And the people I've met with, policymakers, the experts in the field, um, I'm learning a lot. And I, I, I'll really try to, you know, continue with the networks, with the collaborations I've made here so far to, you know, build on my career and also expand my work in the future. Well, it's been a pleasure having you and Thank we you still so have much. you for a little while longer. Yeah, great. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.